Let me just um, begin by um, asking each of the panelists to um, respond to um, the um, response that, that was just given to us by Youssef. That's the one that's most fresh in all of our minds. Let's ask each of the other three to um, engage Youssef on his response. So who would like to go first? I very much agree with Yusuf that ending military aid to Israel is uh, an important step, but certainly not the only step that needs to be taken. And I fully support his call, uh, as does the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation, to engage in campaigns of boycott, divestment, and sanctions uh, against Israel and corporations that profit from its military occupation and apartheid policies towards the Palestinians. And here on UNC's campus, there's an SJP chapter, Students for Justice in Palestine, as there are on probably hundreds of campuses around the country. And on many, many campuses, I don't know what the situation is here, uh, but on many, many campuses, there are such campaigns going on right now. And these campaigns uh, will not in and of themselves bring Israel's economy to its knees and force changes on the Israeli government, uh, but it's nevertheless very symbolic because I think what Israel craves more than anything else, more than the military aid, is acceptance. And just like apartheid South Africa craved acceptance uh, and tried so desperately to get the international community to accept it as a normal member of the international community. This is also what Israel craves. Israel is a rogue nation, though. Israel engages in apartheid towards the Palestinian people. And apartheid is not only a word of relevance to what happened in South Africa, but it's a term that has gained uh, an international meaning. In the 1970s, the United Nations passed a convention on the goal of suppressing and punishing the crime of apartheid. And it defined apartheid very simply as a governmental system whereby one group, based on religion, based on nationality, based on ethnicity, based on language, what have you, attempts to impose discrimination and domination against a different group with different characteristics. Now, if this isn't an accurate description of what Israel's policies are towards the Palestinians, then I don't know what term better suits Israel's policies towards the Palestinians. And the very idea that you can define Israel as a Jewish state and try to encourage coexistence between Jewish Israelis in a privileged position and Palestinian uh, either citizens of Israel or those who live under military occupation or those who live as refugees as somehow subhumans who have less human rights than Israeli Jews is a ridiculous notion. The only way for there to be peace and justice in what's today Israel and occupied Palestinian territory is for there to be an uh, end in a deconstruction of this Israeli apartheid system towards the Palestinian people. That's the only way that peace and justice is going to prevail. I'm very disappointed in the rhetoric and level of discourse that I hear from you, Josh, and um, I don't think it's constructive. Um, Israel is not a rogue nation. I have expressed my dissatisfaction and moral indignity at the, at the state of the occupation, but a lot of your comments uh, are certainly counterproductive to the vast numbers of people in this country who do support Israel and who are deeply committed uh, to its existence. It may be that Israel doesn't need the um, amount of aid that we currently give it, but certainly American foreign policy objectives in the region are deeply embedded in the support for the existence of Israel um, in the long term. So um, I think picking, you know, throwing out uh, horrific numbers, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dignify our conversation with the horrors that have been perpetrated against the Israeli people. They are well known. 
but I don't want to compare uh, indignities and and injustices and horrors that have been inflicted on these two people. Both have suffered horrible ab human rights abuses. I mentioned, I, I would like to mention, look, look, look what has happened to the Christian Arab population. Mainly has left the land of Palestine and lives in Houston and in, 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 in greater Detroit. So this rhetoric does not help push things forward. I had thought we wanted to prosper our relations through dialogue and, 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 and building bridges. But I, I hear a lot of burning bridges. I don't hear building bridges. I would respond with regard to the dwindling Christian uh, presence um, uh, in Israel and in the West Bank. Um, I think if you talk to the Christians, the reason for that dwindling population is because of the occupation. Um, and and so I, I do think we need to note that. Um, Yusef uh, did use the analogy Josh did too of the carrot and the stick. Uh, my concern is um, uh, we have offered all carrot, I think that is correct, and no stick. My concern is though, I don't think we can go to the other extreme and have just stick and no carrot. And so uh, I think it is important that we have conditioned um, U.S. military aid. Yousef, anything you'd like to say about the responses so far to your presentation and these, these last recent uh, comments? Yeah, I, I was just saying, I'm, 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 I'm sorry that our, our uh, co-panelist is, is disappointed. But I would suggest that, that he should direct his disappointment at the policies of the Israeli government. Uh, which I think are properly characterized by uh, by this language. This is an apartheid system, and you know we've often heard this, you know, um, uh, rhetoric about um, you know what's happening to the Palestinian Christian population as some sort of way to you know place the onus on the Palestinians for what's happening to minorities. Uh, there, there's there's one reality here that I think is, is very important: um, the uh, area where the Palestinian Christian population has seen the most significant reduction over time um, uh, in terms of is in the Israeli-controlled municipality of Jerusalem. Um, so uh, this ultimately uh, is about occupation. Uh, this ultimately is uh, uh, about the pressures that, that people feel uh, and um, the, the different forces that are pushing them out of uh, the territory. You know, occupation does not discriminate. You can ask any Palestinian Christian who has been turned away uh, at a checkpoint uh, on the way to, you know, celebrate the Easter Mass as they were recently. Now, the occupation does not care what your religion is. If you are a Palestinian, uh, you are treated as uh, a person with no rights under the occupation. Uh, that's that's just the, the, the way it goes. Okay, um, let me um, shift a bit and... Um ask each of you as uh, our panelists today to reflect on where you think um, common ground um, may exist. And I guess this is a very challenging question given the sharpness of these positions, but it is the concern of the AIM uh, initiative to press for uh, common ground if we can locate it and uh, stand there and work together. Um, so let me ask each of you to reflect on, on what you've heard from each other and where you think uh, common ground may, um, may lay. Could I start with that? If that's sure. Okay? Yes, please. Well, I, I would suggest, and this is where I think everybody could find common ground, um, is that we, we look for guidance uh, at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which is in fact a document that the Israeli government has at least in principle accepted in the course of its joining the United Nations. Uh, and if we look at that document and abide by those principles, there are very simple things that we have to advocate for if we believe in human rights and the equality of human rights, of course. Uh, and those include the right to self-determination for Palestinians uh, and the right of Palestinian refugees to return for their homes. So I think that you know there is a very, very clear, very standardized, a very easy to accept platform that we can all agree to, uh, and it's available for us in, in, in that form. And I think if we use that as a starting point, there's only one inevitable 
uh, trajectory that, that we can lead to, and that's equal rights for Israelis and Palestinians. Okay, thanks, Josh. I mean, excuse me, uh, Yousef? Common ground reflection. I think we have to do this on a person-to-person -person level, and um, you know, it takes projects of, of support. Um, I've mentioned a couple in my presentation. I'm involved with a lot of these, and um, you know, it makes a little dent, and you know, a lot of little dents are going to make progress. But you've got to get people um, talking to one another. Uh, you have to get the Palestinians involved in Jewish society, and the Jewish society involved in Palestinian society. And I think if, you know, rather than tell the U.S. government, you know, you can't give aid to Israel, let's take $200 million from the aid and support projects that support dialogue between these two communities and get larger clusters of people cooperating. Get Al let Al-Quds University do something with Hebrew University, which is two-tenths of a mile away, instead of Bard University in upstate New York. Bard has also made a deal with Ramallah University, with uh, Birzeit University in Ramallah. Why can't the local communities bring people together? And I think, I think that would be an important lobby to put forward to the U.S. Congress, and I think it might have some resonance. I think that's a positive step, and I suggest it, and I repeat that. I do think you're right. I think we have to work on um, at least understanding uh, and developing understanding, and that is does take place through relationships. At the same time, that takes a long time. And while all that is happening, settlement growth continues. Um, the hope for um, a two-state solution is just going down the drain. And uh, while I think it is important to do those things that you advocate for, I think we've got to do something else um, that will bring uh, political change in a quicker fashion. The Jewish community has a number of significant lobbies that are lob lobbying for a two-state solution. I've left literature here from J Street, the Peace Now movement, um, and uh, rabbis for human rights, rabbis including men and women uh, working for human rights, and there are other organizations in, in Israel. Siege for Peace, why does it have to be in, in Maine? Why can't it be done in Jerusalem or in the Galilee or in Samaria? Um, you know, there are a lot of organizations that are working and lobbying in Congress to change the occupation and to move things forward in a positive way. And you, you can't simply say that the Jewish community is deeply divided and you have many, many supporters in the Jewish community, probably majority, who want the occupation to end and want peace to go forward. And we're committed and, and there are a lot of people working, but I mean, screaming and yelling at one another is not gonna uh, get us there. Well, nobody here is screaming. I mean, people here are passionate about what they believe in, but nobody here is screaming. And I really take exception at the notion that there are somehow communal sides that need to be bridged in order to address this issue. First of all, this is not just an issue for Jews and Muslims, or Jews and Christians to dialogue about for that matter. This is an issue that concerns every single American, regardless of our race or ethnicity or religion, because we are all implicated by these policies of Israel that we are supporting through our tax dollars and diplomatic support. But the notion that you can somehow pigeonhole people by their uh, communal identification into believing that there's some kind of bridge that needs to be crossed uh, to have that kind of dialogue and that kind of understanding is, I think, nonsense, to be quite honest. Yusuf mentioned that he is a Palestinian citizen of Israel. I am a Jewish citizen of Israel. My father was born in British Mandate Palestine. I get automatic Israeli citizenship because of that. Now, is there a bridge to be uh, spanned between myself and Yusuf? Maybe, maybe not. But we can both agree on the principles that are inherent in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as Yusuf mentions. And how this can be a basis for saying no to the Israeli system of apartheid and ethnic and religious privileging 
over Palestinians that has taken place now for the last 65 years. To reject that by moving beyond our little tribal identifications and saying that we are human beings, we are part of a global community, and in this day and age, in the 21st century, the notion that you can discriminate and dispossess and hold under apartheid conditions another people because they're of the quote unquote wrong nationality or wrong ethnicity or wrong religion is something that should be rejected by everyone. Um, at this point, uh, let me go ahead and, and suggest that we take our break, and then we'll come back um, and take your questions. Um, I'd like to start by um, pointing out to everyone that something that Eric Myers said about redirecting aid is actually one of the planks in our AIM platform. So I just want to acknowledge that what Eric was saying there about redirecting some parts of the aid to person-person communications is something, it's, we think it's a piece of the puzzle. We think it's a part of the solution and we want to acknowledge that that is something that AIM also endorses. I'd also like to call attention to, um, and then we will open it for questions, um, we have been working uh, with uh, Congressman Price on some of the very strategies that Ron mentioned in his presentation. And um, Congressman Price has written a letter in, on August 7th of 2012 in which he asked some very specific questions of the State Department. Uh, and let me just read a couple of them to remind you of this and then I have a suggestion for all of us. He says, I am aware that the country report for 2011 cites reports by several NGOs, including among others, Betselem, Amnesty International, and UNOCHA, that allege human rights violations. Did the department find these reports did not constitute credible information of gross human rights abuses by Israeli security forces? Question number two, in the case of the government-led destruction of homes in the West Bank, which is well documented and not in dispute, does the department consider such action to constitute a gross violation of human rights? Number three, has the Department of State ever suspended or threatened to suspend aid to Israel under the auspices of the Leahy Amendment? If so, when and how much aid was affected? And number four, has the department ever continued aid despite credible information of gross violations of human rights because of the statutory exception which allows aid to continue if the secretary and the relevant congressional committees determine that the country in question is bringing the, the offenders to justice. Um, we, we did hear from Congressman Price that he got a response from a lower level figure in the State Department, which was, shall we say, much less than cooperative. And um, I, I think it's really important that as citizens, many of whom uh, have Congressman Price as our, our congressman, that you indicate to him that you would like to see him press forward. Uh, in the political um, landscape of Washington, it's difficult for one congressman to stand alone. He can do it more forcefully if he knows that he ha you have his back. Um, so I would encourage you to contact him and, in and endorse his efforts to get the Leahy Amendment enforced and his work with the State Department. Uh, and if you have friends around the country, please let them know that their advocacy with their congresspeople is helpful on that front. And I believe that several of the other organizations are working on this. I think, uh, Josh, isn't the U.S. campaign working on this front as well? So, I, I mean, I think this is, a, this is a, one of the areas where I think we could find some common, law, some common ground around U.S. law. Did, did you all hear that? Mir Miriam is saying, if you'll sign one of these pledge cards and put it in the box out there, it'll give us an opportunity to send you a PDF of uh, the letter from, um, from Congressman Price and keep you posted of other efforts. All right, um, at this point we have, let, let's, um, let me ask the panel to just hold off on my question and let's turn it over to the audience at this point for the remaining 25 minutes. The questions um, are now available. I, Ron, I see your hand in the back, and there's a mic here, so please wait for the mic so we can all hear you. Uh, thank you. First, first of all, thank you to all the panelists and for, to the organizers. Uh, this has been a wonderful event, and it's great to see so many people here. I find it difficult to be in any way 
um, as optimistic as you, Eric, um, with regards to the situation um, in Israel. You're, you're right that, uh, Liv, Liv, for example, that Livni was put in charge of um, Palest dialogue with Palestinians, but in coalition agreements with, with both Yeshatid um, and Jewish Home, the fact how her role has been handed over to other far more extreme people um, who have actually been put in charge of it. To me, Livni is a fig leaf, and as usual with Israeli elections, whether or not there is a move to the right or the left, there is a the coalition that has formed ignores, completely ignores wishes of the electorate uh, one way or another, and instead gives them to the classical usual power brokers who in previous, in recent years have been moving further and further and further to the right. But um, I want to ask a simple question, though. You, you talked about um, a need to improve municipal services in, East, in Arab areas of East Jerusalem, and I think that would be a wonderful thing. But I think there's a problem with that that gets to the heart of a conflict. Who would be in charge of those services? If it is Israel, then you're entrenching the occupation in East Jerusalem. And you're, you're essentially saying, this is permanent. If it is the PA, then we are supporting a government which is arguably unelected, certainly way past its term. And so this, these very basic questions are not simple. Um, these very basic questions of dialogue and contact are not simple questions. Why hasn't there been much contact between Al-Quds and Al-Quds University and Jerusalem University? Because the Israeli authorities have not wished there to be. They have blocked um, any contact between them to the point where Israeli and Palestinian academics most often meet in Cyprus. Um, it's not simply a matter of getting there. It's a matter of overcoming the huge power structures and, uh, and the US-supported and US-funded power structures. So how do you propose through when dialogue is actively being prevented to get from here to there? I agree with all you, you said, and I did not endorse the annexation of Jerusalem when I suggested that better municipal services be offered. I think that they should be offered because they're in desperate need of having them immediately. If you look at the garbage pile up in, in, in Silwan or uh, Abu Dis, uh, and um, the state of the roads repaired and all the rest, I mean, it's, it's, it's a disgrace. So, I mean, there are a few, the, the more optimistic signs are carriers shuttling and something's happening. And as you know, this audience certainly knows, when anything important happens in the Middle East, it's in secret. So we are clueless about that. All we have um, are hints that something is happening. The ambassador was called uh, to, to travel with Kerry, uh, secret meetings in Ramallah, you know. So something is happening. It, you know, at least, at least it's back on the table. I mean, for four years it disappeared um, in the first Obama administration. I think that's good. I don't. I, I believe that all of these problems can only be solved with an international peace agreement. I don't think, the, I agree with you, I don't think the Israeli government is constituted in any way to, to bring about the change that didn't happen since 1967. I think either the quartet or some group that the United States convenes in a, in a massive peace conference and bring about peace, that's the only way all of this is going to get done. We can lobby against USAID, we can lobby to have, you know, big chunk of it or chunk of it put forward in humanistic endeavors to promote interaction. It's not going to solve the problem. Listen, I've worked there for 50 years, spent my whole life working in Israel and the West Bank and in Arab countries. And uh, listen, I've never seen it worse. I said that. I was looking for little rays of hope. But right now, I think the situation is desperate is in urgent need of full attention of the world's power, including the US. And you see what's happening. That's why I began with the global picture. It is, it is a disaster in the making, and we need help. Um, My involvement in this issue is, grew out of 
longtime involvement on human rights campaigns related to U.S. military aid, going back to El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras in the 1980s and others. And I appreciate, Ron, your citation of the countries where the allies of the United States, where in fact such restrictions had been had been put in place in the past. Now, as I, as, as I look at some of that history, is, I mean, with Turkey, Indonesia, Pakistan, certainly the U.S. security interests in those arenas at the time that the, that, that was undertaken, uh, it's difficult to see them exceeding the U.S. security uh, interests involved with Israel uh, right now even, uh, given, I mean, the, the naval sea lanes around Indonesia, uh, the and the the uh, role of Pakistan in the in the subcontinent. What uh, what? Or, and I would invite any of the speakers who have some familiarity with this. What were some of given the the vagueness of the response that the State Department gave to uh, to Representative Price's letter of inquiry, uh, and kind of the, the 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 seeming refusal to engage the particularities of the situation in the occupied territories in Palestine, what were some of the driving factors, political or otherwise, in those instances that you think might be informative for us today in trying to move the State Department forward on this? Or is State Department determination on these issues you know, wholly the creature of political interests? Well, I would say that in general, the State Department and the U.S. political system more broadly is incredibly opaque about the way that it deals with human rights violations around the world that are committed with U.S. weapons. So unfortunately, these laws uh, that I cited in my presentation are not honored very often. I'm not, I'm not only talking about Israel, I'm talking about globally, so that for you know, decades, uh, Colombia has been one of the largest recipients of U.S. military aid in the world. I think it's the third largest, or at least it was before we started giving uh, Iraq and Afghanistan lots of money, but still in the top five. And there have been significant human rights and systematic human rights abuses that have been tied in with U.S. military aid to Colombia. So, you know, uh, the lack of accountability around Israel is certainly not an exception. But in no place has US military aid uh, been more egregiously and clearly and systematically used to commit human rights abuses uh, than in Israel's misuse of its weapons uh, towards the Palestinians. And uh, you know, I'm a firm believer in equality. Uh, I don't believe that countries should be held to lower or different standards than others. I believe we should have one level of accountability and that the United States should not be arming uh, global uh, human rights abusers uh, across the globe and not just Israel. You said? Um, I would just add in response to the, the gentleman's question and also in response to the, uh, the what you had mentioned about the letter that you got from the congressman or, or um, the information that he received from the uh, State Department. Uh, I think this is really representative of um, a, a general trend that we've seen for so many years, is that um, Washington is not going to be helpful on this issue. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with domestic politics. Um, and you know, that's a, that's a discussion that can, can go on um, with, with plenty of anecdotes for, for hours and hours. But the reality is, uh, this is, number one, um, a pro-Israel country. And Washington is an even more pro-Israel town uh, than, um, than is the, the rest of the country. Um, so to, to really get anything um, even-handed out of Washington, I think, is kind of a fairy tale. Uh, but that is why we've seen so many people move towards civil society actions, uh, which is precisely what BDS is, is, uh, is all about. But what has become clear, I think undeniably, is that there has to be more pressure on Israel to get it to change its behavior. Uh, and what is also clear, 20 years into a peace process mediated by Washington, during which the number of settlers in occupied territory had tripled, is that Washington is not going to be the source of that pressure. And so it has to come from somewhere else. 
Uh, and while I applaud the, the efforts to, to, to seek traction on this issue uh, in the nation's capital, I think it has to be at minimum coupled with efforts at the civil society level to engage in BDS campaigns uh, in an effort to uh, enact um, punitive measures against the Israeli economy and, and, and the Israeli state in an effort to change Israeli state behavior. Another question? Yes, uh, Yes, the, the issue of the behavior, uh, I always wondered why they're never accountable. For example, like I'm from Lebanon and the bridges were destroyed, the airport, I mean, so much, so much destruction from, from a Palestinian throwing a stone, he gets a rocket back and his house gets demolished, olive trees pulled, water stolen. I mean, it's overreaction always. I mean, always it's an overreaction. I hope you all agree with, with me on that. So instead of saying, oh, I'm sorry, this was a missed target, why don't they compensate? The, the, the building, the United Nations building in, in Ghana, in, in, Lebanon, in South Lebanon, was demolished with you know, hundreds of people dying, women and children who were there f to, to, to seek refuge. And then, oh, yeah, sorry. And despite all the technology they have, it was a missed target. We know it's not a missed target, but let's say it is a missed target. So, so you are sorry, why don't you pay for it? Why don't you compensate? Why don't you, uh, uh, so wh where, where can we apply pressure? so that the Israeli government can pay back the lands, the, 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 you know, the, the reconstruction. The bridges that were um, destroyed in my country were built by Germany, France, England, not, not, not hardly any by US, or nothing is never anything from Israel. So any soldier who, who um, shoots, uh, you know, makes a mistake in the US Army, he gets, you know, they get a trial, they, they go, they go in, in jail, and I mean, they talk about, they, they investigate into it. They don't just say, he's sorry. What do you think can be done about that? <laughs> Quickly. Can everyone who has a mic turn it off unless you're using it, please? We're getting some feedback. There's this amazing document that came up from WikiLeaks, Cablegate, the millions and millions of State Department cables that were leaked, uh, in which the, I think it's the US ambassador is sitting with an Israeli army general. This is about a month after Operation Cast Lead, where Israel massacred more than 1,400 Palestinians in the course of three weeks, the vast majority of whom were civilians. And this Israeli general brags to the US ambassador how Israel has demolished every single governmental structure in the Gaza Strip and destroyed, he's, he says, we've destroyed every single desk. And now it's your responsibility. You go in and you fix it. You pay for it. So after we give the money for Israel to destroy the Palestinian civilian infrastructure and the Lebanese civilian infrastructure, and by the way, I didn't mention that also during that same time when the U.S. provided these 670 million weapons to Israel in the past decade, Israel also killed more than 1,000 uh, Lebanese civilians in the summer of 2006 and destroyed an estimated $2 billion worth of Lebanese civilian infrastructure on top of all the damage uh, and human rights abuses that were committed against Palestinians. Uh, so you're right, there's a culture of impunity, and impunity breeds more acts of uh, violence and outrage. But the reason why, why does Israel always over, overreact? I don't think it overreacts. I think when you have a system of oppression, that type of systematic and overwhelming violence is necessarily built into the structure to maintain it. The same thing with slavery in the United States was premised on this huge systematic violence that was committed against the enslaved population. And so that's the only way that you can attempt to sustain uh, people under the boot of that type of oppression. But how long can it last? How much, how much longer can it go on for? Another question? If I could yeah, just go yeah. on the oh, case of Lebanon. Can you hear me okay? Go ahead. 
Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, folks, I can't um, hear you, but I understand that you could hear me. I just wanted to point out on the case of, of Lebanon, in particular, as the lady's question uh, was referring to, um, you know, what we saw in, in, in that particular conflict was um, particularly egregious behavior on behalf of the United States uh, in that it, it not only did not act to bring the hostilities to an end as quickly as possible, but it also uh, sent, uh, expedited an additional military aid to Israel uh, to continue the uh, bombing of, of Lebanon, which was, of course, uh, especially punitive. One um, uh, Israeli, uh, ranking Israeli army official said that they were going to turn back Lebanon's clock 20 years uh, at the time. Uh, and in the last 72 hours of that uh, conflict, after a ceasefire had already been um, uh, agreed upon, uh, after that 72-hour period, uh, Israel decided to drop the vast majority of the cluster bombs that it would use during that uh, entire uh, conflict during the last uh, several minutes, uh, an effort to inflict maximum uh, damage. And of course, there are to this day um, Lebanese civilians who are feeling the effects of cluster munitions, uh, which have uh, left large parts of, of um, uh, Lebanese uh, land and, and territory in areas where uh, this bombing happened uh, extremely dangerous uh, for civilians who are often losing arms and limbs and, and their lives, unfortunately. Is it on? Hello. Uh, I, I know you were looking for area of commonality before, and I, I very much agree that, of course, it would be wonderful if we could agree as a commonality that everyone loves the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I mean, it's, it's like motherhood, and I love it. But to, realistically, can all the panelists, at least right here, these panelists, agree for sure that they should stop settlements, just dead stop settlement activities? Now, I'm not even asking reverse it. I'm talking about just stop it forever from now on. <laughs> we all agree. I think we're really unified in that. Anyone who dissents from that view. Well, uh, I wanted to quote from something my brother in, in Palestine uh, uh, always told me. Okay, so Tony Blair comes, Clinton leaves, Bush comes, Obama goes. And he tells me there is really nothing change of us to, for us on the ground. More settlements, we wake up in the morning, more home demolitions, more people jailed, and, and the process continued. So he keeps saying, those roads you come and build to us, so those uh, uh, few medicines sent to the hospitals are not changing anything, will never change anything. So he took me and he showed me where the farm that our fam my family lost and the villages. And he said, well, there is nothing going to change unless this land comes to us. So this dialogue with Israeli citizens who are cultivating our land is absurd. I mean, how could you dialogue with somebody who stole your land? It's not going to happen. So this Israeli superiority with this military aid, the massive economic aid and this economic political support, the UN is literally becoming a, a joke when it comes to what Israel is doing and what they are paying for. But that will lead me to the next question. Anyone thinks that a two-state solution is here or realistic is really living in a different world. The two-state solution is gone. Now, where we go from here, what is next? I mean, yeah, we're going to have the fourth Geneva Convention and all of that. But when it's all done, even if, the, if Israel tomorrow treats the Palestinians with flowers every morning on their doorsteps in the purse bag, 70% of their land is gone. So assume they're going to respect their rights. And that's exactly where Israel is going. They're going to control the land, and they're going to provide them TVs and cars and a few things to live happily. This is the morphine that will quiet the Palestinian people. Uh, so the question is, when it's all done, two state is gone, what is next?
Is this on? Yeah, that's on. Yeah, it's on. Uh, I mean, uh, technically, uh, and from an engineering perspective, of course, if Israel decided that it wanted to have a realistic two-state resolution to the conflict, it could theoretically dismantle all of the settlement infrastructure. It could theoretically dismantle all of the apartheid road system that's been built into place. It could theoretically dismantle the apartheid wall. Uh, but the reality is that it's not doing that, and it's not going to do that. When Netanyahu came and spoke to Congress in 2011, the biggest bombshell he dropped was that Israeli colonists now numbered two-thirds of a million beyond the 67 green lines showing no signs of even stopping, much less reversing this colonization. So uh, yeah, it is a hypothetical question because no Israeli government ever has put on the table a serious legitimate offer for there to be a truly sovereign and viable Palestinian state. They've always been versions of different Bantu stands where Palestinians would have some type of nominal autonomy, but all sovereignty would remain with Israel. Um, now, where do we go from here? Well, I, I think things are very clearly heading in a particular direction. I think what we're seeing today is the unpartitioning of Palestine. I think there's a growing understanding that there is one uh, authority that controls 100% of historic Palestine, uh, and that that authority is the government of Israel. So the only question is, is Israel going to continue as an apartheid state, and for how long? And what, ty what type of equality is there going to be eventually between Israelis and Palestinians? Now, as a US organization, I'm not advocating for or against any particular resolution. It's not my business. Uh, but you know, it's very clear that there cannot be a permanent resolution to the conflict that's based on the notion of apartheid. It has to be equality, whether it's uh, some form of one person, one vote system, or some type of binational confederation. I think that's definitely where things are headed. Yusuf, did you want to weigh in on that? Uh, yes, uh, if you could hear me okay. I'm sorry, I had lost you at, um, at some point, but was able to hear again around um, at the end of Josh's uh, response. And I understood that the question was sort of where are we headed at this point? Um, I think, uh, you know, I, 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 hearing most of Josh's uh, response, I think we're already at a point where we've, we've, um, we've crossed the threshold. I don't think two states is possible at, um, at this point. Um, Israeli settlement uh, expansion is so entrenched in the West Bank, uh, and the uh, removal uh, now of even 100,000 Israeli settlers, which is the very bare minimum necessary for, for territorial contiguity in the West Bank, um, would cost Israel percent of its its GDP. Um, the the interests are stacked uh, so heavily against uh, withdrawal uh, and the creation of a Palestinian state for Israel because its occupation has become so deep and so entrenched uh, and so thick within the West Bank, and um, because uh, settlers have also become so entrenched within the Israeli political system. You have today, uh, for um, you know, really the first time ever. Um, a, a very strong contingency of religious nationalists within the uh, Israeli government um, uh, uh, that are further to the right uh, of Avigdor Lieberman, who you know only um, only a couple elections ago was considered a far right ultra nationalist. Now, next to the characters that we have today, like Naftali Bennett and and uh, and and his crowd, um, you know he's he's not even considered the the furthest to the right anymore. Um, so, you know, settler interests are represented not only in the state decision calculus, but also in the decision calculus of political actors. Uh, and we're not going to see that, that decision calculus changed anytime soon by real um, state level action for the, the, the reasons that we've discussed um, already. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the question of partition is one that, that is, you know, a very serious question. We are now at a point where the egg is so far scrambled. Uh, that it is not going to be unscrambled. Uh, the question moving forward is how do you have uh, a system of justice and human rights and equality uh, in a framework that respects both people within a single state? That's going to be the discussion of the future and I think we're moving there uh, already. I don't think that um, you know the powers that be particularly in Washington and, and in Europe are ready to acknowledge that reality because they've had so much invested in a two-state outcome. But make no mistake, we're already at that point, and anyone who's traveled through the West Bank 
uh, and has seen um, the, uh, the extent of Israeli settlement expansion uh, and, and what's involved there uh, could tell you this. In having some of the key points sort of a little nuanced if possible. Number one, on the settlers, as I understand it, certainly until recently, a very substantial percentage, and I believe a majority, would be willing to evacuate provided they have the same conditions of living within Israel, which means per capita expenditure on education um, and housing and so on. Now that may now be not the case, but we need to make a distinction between the majority, whatever it is, and the leadership, which of course is very right wing. Uh, second point of nuance is Israel essential for U.S. in Middle East, which is a frequent point made. I think what one needs to say here is that the U.S. is just as concerned about Iran, because that's the linking point, um, as is Israel, which doesn't mean that we would necessarily support every step and when uh, Israel is, but we are profoundly concerned. Because otherwise, the, uh, the statement that it's our main ally, given the Arab Spring and so on, I don't know to what extent that really is all that good for the US. And the only point, um, a third point is I thank you folks for drawing my attention something I did not know, namely the refugee problem before 1948. That is extremely interesting. I've seen those devastated villages, incidentally, those dead villages. And the final point is, and that's the only way I'm not fully on the left here, but I am otherwise totally, and that is return of refugees. And I would apply that to any conflict. We're now 80 years behind when it took place, um, or 70 years, and you can't go on with that. And you, you couldn't, if it's a two-state solution, to have, a, or one state, a huge influx of one of the elements. I don't think it's realistic. It's not that I object to it and thought, of, oh, well, a lot of Jews were expelled from Iraq and Iran and so on. Uh, we aren't saying anything. But I, I think it's simply on a practical basis. You can't go back uh, on a practical basis that much. But Jews are still returning who have never been there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to return, and they've never been there. They have no roots in there. But you're saying the Palestinians 80 years, they cannot return. I mean, what is this double standard? Separate or not, I think we are headed to one state, and if the Jews are going to return, then the Palestinians should return, sir. Um, all right, let me just uh, do a check. It's 5 o'clock, and I, I can first say the several hands that have raised their hand. Um, uh, how about if we, if we say this? Um, let me, let me, are we kind of willing to stay for a few more minutes for a few more questions? Um, and I, we obviously are, we said five. How about if we can make an official end at this point and those that would like to stay for a few more questions, the panelists can stay for a few more minutes. Um, would you join me in thanking our panelists? Um, the evangelical um, support of Israel these uh, recent years has been very counterproductive, to put it mildly, and um, uh, people like Hagee and um, uh, I'm, I won't go beyond Hagee, but I mean he's, he exemplifies the Christian dispensationalist 
millennialists that have um, given such support of Israel, they have become so much more uh, popular since the Christian right emerged. I think this has um, made things in the U.S. Congress and in certain areas of the country much more difficult. And I mean, you have Bible parks, creationists that they're doing, and I, I, this has really been a very negative development. Let me, let me add one thing to that. Um, in our work with Congressman Price, uh, his legislative aide uh, told us that Congressman Price had confided in him that he had personally seen a shift over the last five years in his own constituency from one that was predominantly pro-Israel in the sense that they weren't really asking uh, Congressman Price to entertain any kind of uh, criticism of Israel at all. Um, it was just sort of uniformly pro-Israel. But then in the last five years, he'd seen a shift among his own constituents here in this area to a willingness to um, to to, uh, in, to countenance criticism of Israel and to press the congressman for uh, greater uh, work on the Leahy Amendment and the Foreign Assistance Act and these kinds of things. So I think within his own constituency, uh, he sees a shift. And I think that could be observed in some quarters around the country. Okay, let's, yeah. <clears throat> I think in many respects there's been profound and fundamental changes in public opinion over the last decade. I mean, I don't think 10 years ago you could have put up ads in every single bus in Chapel Hill saying end aid to Israel. Uh, a lot of public space has opened up to have conversations that have been too long suppressed. Uh, Yusuf gets his op-eds into the New York Times. <laughs> That's amazing. That's an amazing sign of how much space is opening up in US political discourse to have honest and real conversations about Israel and US support for Israel. Uh, so these things are all great. But I also totally agree with Yusuf that uh, the political system is so built in uh, to support Israel. And in many respects, that's because this Israel lobby has had decades of virtually unchallenged opposition to build that political support into the very um, fabric of our US institutional life, politics, economics, social, culture, everything. So it's going to take a lot of time to undo that, unfortunately. But I think we're well underway. And I think that the democratization of the media that we've seen, social media, Etc. really enables uh, people to bypass this sort of traditional uh, discourse that has treated Israel as a holy cow and as something that cannot be discussed uh, in this country. All right. Um, yes. Oh, you, you said... If, if I could just, I just wanted to, because um, uh, I kind of uh, lost sound again, but um, I heard, again, Josh's response and, and the question here. Yes, uh, the discourse is definitely changing. Uh, the changes are most uh, profound and noticeable uh, among the youngest demographics in the United States. Uh, and so I think over time we're going to change uh, in that discourse uh, in a direction that continues to question very critically U.S. support uh, for Israel. Of course, this is something that is going to take time, uh, but it is happening, and it is very clear that it is happening, and as Josh mentioned, technology is a big part of that. But I did want to answer the, um, the question of the gentleman uh, that, that was posed um, a few moments ago, and I, I didn't get a chance to hear if anyone answered this, uh, regarding the implementation of repatriation schemes for Palestinian refugees and whether or not it's practical or not. Uh, and, and whether or not it's something that should just be, um, you know, forgotten. Uh, the refugee question is the core of Palestinian grievance uh, with Israel. Um, the vast majority of um, Palestinians have a connection uh, to the uh, territory that is today Israel, uh, many uh, of whom are refugees from that territory. There needs to be a serious conversation uh, and, 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 uh, and policy planning put forward about repatriation schemes and how to make it happen uh, on a practical level. But there is no doubt that refugees uh, should have the right to choose. Uh, and, it is, and it is a right that is codified, by the way, in, in, in international law, uh, that refugees have a right uh, to return. 
Um, and, and so this is something that um, has to happen for there to be uh, any just peace agreement. Why do Israelis um, object to this? They object to this because they say that um, the introduction of Palestinians into the state of Israel would mean that there would be too many Palestinians uh, challenging the Jewish character of the state. Um, more or less, this is a direct uh, admission of apartheid. It is the, um, the clear denial of human rights in the form of the repatriation of, of refugees which have a right to return uh, for uh, the uh, direct purpose of maintaining a political uh, monopoly on power uh, by one uh, ethnic group. Uh, I, I don't think it could be um, any clearer than that. And I will just uh, give you an example on a personal, very personal level. As I mentioned to you in the beginning, I happen to be a Palestinian citizen uh, of Israel. Uh, my wife happens to be a Palestinian citizen uh, from the occupied West Bank in Nablus. Um, she is not, of course, an Israeli citizen. Other Israeli people from outside of um, the state of Israel naturalize their citizens over time. They can immigrate and reside together within the state of Israel as, uh, as in most other states. Palestinians, however, cannot do this. Why? Because the state of Israel is uh, afraid or challenged by what the Israeli Prime Minister today, then in 2003, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu had said, is demographic spillover. And that law just this morning was extended for another year that Palestinians like myself cannot live uh, reunited with uh, Palestinian citizens uh, of the West Bank simply because there would then be too many Palestinians. I mean, we're living in the year 2013. This sort of this sort of um, ethnic, uh, socio-demographic engineering should be a thing of the past. Uh, but unfortunately, this is, this is what, you know, what Zionism demands. It's a big part of the problem. Equality, I think, is the only way forward. Um, well, I hope that what remains of the audience and the panel agree that uh, while we've been talking about U.S. military aid, um, none of this can be done in isolation. And uh, the fact is, is that European attitudes need to change as much as U.S. attitudes. Um, I've not lived and worked in the Middle East as long as Dr. Myers. I've only, only 14 years compared to his 50. Um, so I fully defer to his, his greater knowledge and his exit. Um, but what I do know as someone from the UK is that the argument for or against military aid is reflected in the leaders we put forward. And from a European perspective, Tony Blair, in the context of the Middle East peace process, is about as welcome as a steak at a vegan garden party. <laughs> he has done less than little, in my humble opinion. And it's a it's a real shame that Dr. Myers has left because I would have liked his opinion on what Tony Blair has actually done to benefit the peace process, but I will take um, any comments from the remaining panel um, on, on what they feel Tony Blair should have done in the last five years um, that, uh, that he didn't. If I, I, I could just make one comment here on, on Europe, if I could. Um, I, I don't have too much to say about Tony Blair. Um, but uh, as far as Europe is concerned, Europe is changing. And Europe is changing a lot quicker than the United States is on this issue. And I think we'll get to um, you know, where we need to get to move forward uh, well before the United States does. And we'll be a stepping stone towards the United States changing its policy eventually. Because let's face it, um, once uh, Europe turns, the United States is going to also be isolated in its continued support for Israeli apartheid. It can't. It can't continue to do this forever. Uh, and um, you know, what we've seen uh, in Europe um, through the Europe, so individual you know, European actors is a increased discussion about the use of sticks in the form of sanctions against Israeli products coming from the occupied territories. That is not a state level conversation that you're seeing in the United States. But that is starting to happen in Europe. And I think as that develops, you will gradually see changes in actual government policy. Again, this, these are things that will take time, but it's clear that Europe 
has moved uh, much further and much faster on this issue in the right direction than the United States, and I think we can only hope that they continue to do so. All right. Um, let me just say finally, we do have these yellow flashcards, and I would just encourage you, if you're not already signed one of those, please to do so. It will give us an opportunity to contact you. Thank you again for coming. Thank you.